Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? We're, I don't think that you can hear us. I can hear myself. Sound check, sound check. Раз, два, три. Can you hear English translation? Can you hear? Уважаемые техники, можно ли сделать что-нибудь со звуком? Слышно меня? Now it sounds just great. So good morning, everyone. Please excuse us for for a little delay. I'm very grateful to everyone who joined us here in this Technopolis Moscow at the Forum of Open Innovations. And thank you very much that you start your business program of open innovations from our session, uh, building a new ecosystem and sociocultural differences. Uh, the, it's not such an easy topic, and we would like to talk about not only about political and uh, social uh, build blocks of uh, the system, but we would like to talk about more about the uh, different features that uh, influence uh, the forming of the process, uh, innovative process in different societies. Oftentimes we ask ourselves why in different countries innovation process goes in a different, with different pace. Why in uh, one society there are certain difficulties and delays when you're trying to implement new technologies and a different society, different country, they're just uh, mega capable of uh, introducing innovations. Who is the one? Who is the decision maker? This is a state companies, maybe uh, scientists and small companies, these are the ones who make decisions and implement or venture investors. Is the situation the same in different countries or what are the, the different countries' uh, peculiarities in uh, promoting innovation? So we would like to to make a comparison of different national ecosystems, innovation ecosystems, what models they have in different countries and to understand how to adapt it and uh, some successful um, uh, practices uh, of innovations, how social cultural peculiarities, how they influence the international collaboration, and what useful Russia can take from the West and East in order to uh, promote innovation uh, policies uh, with less cost. I would like to introduce our speakers today, Alexei Wexler. This is a uh, Deputy uh, Minister of Energy of Russian Federation, uh, Vasily Belov, Senior Vice President of Innovation, Skolkova Foundation, F uh, Frank Fo, uh, Executive Vice President, uh, Business Development and Kingsoft Office Software, Mr. Francis Yeo, uh, the uh, Professor of Entrepreneurship Mastery at the School of Information Technology of National University of Singapore, Mr. Suen, senior staff scientist of McKenzie Global Institute in Oran Kahavi, uh, director of Terra Venture Partners. So our speakers today, they came from different countries, and therefore we start first a discussion from the international aspect. And I would like to give the floor to Mr. Uh, Suen, the uh, executive senior staff uh, uh, scientist of McKenzie Global. Uh, Mr. S uh, gentlemen, uh, innovation processes that we, uh, that happen in China, this is a professional interest of yours. And just recently, under your dear direction, there was a big study, China to the, uh, on the way to uh, information technologies and how internet influences production and growth. And quite long ago, we started studying innovation process in China. Could you tell us how principal it is uh, to have the social, cultural peculiarities to implement innovations for that inno innovation uh, miracle that we uh, all see in China? First of all, um, thank you for 
having me here today. So I fundamentally believe in the, uh, the power of innovation you know, from the uh, emerging market. So I'm really excited to be here to you know, share um, ideas and opinions on the other innovation, right? So from China angle and also from Russia angle, right? And let me, uh, uh, to, to answer your question, right? So let me start with another question, right? Which is a, a stupid yet a, a very fundamental question that we need to address, right? Which is, you know, does innovation matter at all, right? And the answer should be yes, right? So otherwise, we won't be here. We all won't be here today, right? And in the, uh, the context of China, that is even more important, right? So, so for example, you know, China showed a, a dramatic and phenomenal growth over the past, you know, three decades, right? And, and that has been largely driven by, you know, heavy capital expenditure. Right? And, and the labor force expansion, right? So that has been the, uh, the previous you know, economic you know, growth model in China, right? But then if you look at the other uh, future, right? So this model will not be sustainable, right? So you cannot indefinitely you know, continue to invest more and more capital into the economy, right? Because then there will be huge you know, resource allocation and, and overcapacity, you know, marginal return of rate uh, issues, right? And also labor force expansion, right? So the, the, the labor force, the, the working population in China is actually decreasing, right? And then they are getting more and more expensive. So you know, relying on cheap labor, right? Those, you know, competitiveness that has worked well in the past will decrease, right? But then, you know, what should China do, right? So, so that, you know, China can continue to grow, you know, 7% of GDP or 6% of GDP, you know, what should China do? You know, how should China solve this problem, right? And, and there will be, you know, many, you know, approaches to solve this problem, but then, you know, one important aspect is to drive innovation, right? Because innovation will fundamentally change the, the nature of the growth and change the, um, um, the, the economic model in China from you know, previous you know, heavy capital expenditure model to a, a, a new model, right? And then the, the latest research that uh, we uh, just you know, published, uh, that was mainly focusing on digital innovation, digital revolution in China, right? And then the impact from digital, right? The internet alone will contribute at least, you know, one-fifth of the GDP growth, right? Over the coming decade, right? And then if we broaden that uh, impact to the, uh, the entire innovation space, the, the impact will be even bigger, right? And, and in terms of the, uh, the, the, the nature of the, the growth, right? So the innovation, will bring in you know, new market, new product, new services into the economy, right? And then it's going to create new exciting jobs, right? So that is you know, higher paid, you know, more you know, creative, uh, creativity oriented, you know, more knowledge oriented jobs, right? So, so that you know, at the individual level, you know, people can realize their dreams, right? So this will be the, um, the overall uh, impact of the innovation in the economy, right? So GDP growth, you know, productivity growth, you know, wage growth, and then realization of individual dreams, right? And that is important in China, and, and that's why uh, the, the Chinese leaders keep emphasizing the, uh, the innovation as a core pillar of growth strategy. And I'm sure that, you know, Premier Li will talk about it at uh, 11 a.m. session today. Then, you know, what is the innovation model in China, right, today, right? So, you know, based upon our observation, and then if I have to summarize the China innovation model in one word, you know, that'll be innovation through commercialization, right? And, and when we think about innovation, you know, there are mainly, you know, two different levels of innovation, right? So the first level of innovation is so-called, you know, breakthrough innovation, right? So that is, you know, based on the fundamental, you know, new breakthrough findings. So for example, you know, invention of the electricity, right? Invention of the transistor or, you know, the new, you know, raw material like, you know, silicon, right, et cetera, et cetera, right? Internet, right? So this is the, uh, the, the, the most foundational, you know, level of innovation. So that's, you know, one type of innovation. And, and this is, you know, for the moment, you know, largely driven by, you know, developed economy, right? And second type of innovation is so-called incremental innovation, right? So you, you are not necessarily creating something fundamentally new and breakthrough, 
but you are extremely good at you know leveraging the, the existing technology, you know putting them together, synthesizing them in a very creative way, turn that into product, and then you know sell to the uh, consumers and customers, and then that beautifully solves the problem of a country of the economy, um, and and there is, and and that is very successful in terms of. You know, uh, uh, you know, commercializing and, and creating a new value, right? So this type of innovation is the um, the current innovation model that is very prevalent in China, and and going forward, you know, this model may continue to evolve, right? But then, you know, so, so innovation through commercialization is, you know, I would say, you know, one, you know, big theme, right, to characterize the uh, the, the the China's innovation model, right? And then to share some example, right? For example. Um, e-commerce, right? So e-commerce um, is based upon, you know, breakthrough internet technology, which is invented in the U.S., right? But then the commercialization, the big commercialization has happened in China, right? So, for example, if you look at the size of e-tail market, you know, China, China's uh, e-tail uh, market is, you know, close to 300 billion, which is already larger than the uh, U.S., right? Um, and if you look at the, the most representative company in the e-commerce space, you know, that is Alibaba, which just went, you know, IPO, you know, a few weeks ago. And then the, the, the market cap of Alibaba is bigger than Amazon and, and eBay combined, right? So China is extremely, you know, uh, uh, doing a great job in terms of, you know, commercializing the, the, the fundamental technology and bring it to Chinese cons cons customers and then for example Alibaba you know how did they this uh, do this so well right and then you know that is mainly based upon the the, the super you know local you know consumer insights so, so they extreme they understand the local customers extremely well the pain points extremely well so for example um, you know when you know uh, when there was a, 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 a initial you know the development of the e-commerce it didn't really pick up because there was a trust issue in terms of payment and they introduced the other concept of escrow payments, right? So-called, you know, Alipay system, uh, which, you know, eBay didn't in China. So they just, you know, basically the overturn the game, right? And then they, you know, introduced, you know, series of new innovation in Chinese market, you know, based upon local insights, um, and 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 in, and and based upon efficiency in terms of speed and cost, right? So I believe. You know, a lot of you know other Chinese companies are doing this and and will do this. So this is going to continue, and then there will be a lot of inter interesting innovation through commercialization. You know, coming you know out of China. Mr. Suyan, but in any case, I would like to ask you, in your opinion, uh, was it principle that uh, unique? Chinese workers' capability uh, for this principal growth of innovations or those successes that were achieved in China, that breakthrough growth of the few decades uh, with the, the same influence of the state and stimulation of innovation policy from the state, it would be possible in any other country, or this is all Chinese people's labor and capability to work so hard? characteristics from the other uh, Chinese market right so for example for innovation to happen right so you really need you know three you know elements right so one is you know new idea new interesting idea right which is largely coming from the scientists is coming from people right so human capital right and 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 uh, that, that can be, you know, scientists or entrepreneurs, right? And then, you know, second is, you know, how to turn this idea into products, right? And then for this, you need an ecosystem, right? So you need, you know, venture capital. You need a, a, a cluster to really foster this uh, uh, product to, to be incubated, right? And then the third element is the market, the consumer, uh, who are willing to embrace the, the new, you know, uh, products and, 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 and new, you know, tries, right? So from this, you know, innovative you know companies right so if you look at these elements right so China you know had a, a good amount of you know entrepreneurs who were willing to you know take risk right and then you know they also had a you know venture capital um, to fund you know these these ideas and then uh, and who are patient enough to you know wait and 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 
and, and fund the growth, right, in the, in the long term, right? Uh, and then in terms of market, the Chinese consumers, right, particularly in, you know, tier three, tier four cities in, in case of Alibaba, right, who struggle to buy the product that they want, right? So they loved um, this uh, new, you know, e-commerce model and they embraced this technology, right? So, um, so along this dimension, right, so yes, you know, there are some, you know, unique, you know, Chinese characteristics, right? But then, you know, those principles, right, uh, can be also replicated in the other countries, right? So for example, you know, rather than uh, focusing too much or, you know, uh, scientific research, right, driving, you know, breakthrough, you know, be practical, right? And then identify the problems that the consumers or citizens have in a certain economy, apply, you know, practical, you know, knowledge and, and, and turn that knowledge, you know, into a product that can solve the, uh, the, the problems. Thank you very much. This is right the recipe that uh, Alibaba company became such uh, the biggest company to go on IPO. According to the forecast to 2020, the center of business activity will be shifted from Europe and Central America to Asia, and there will be more than 60 percent of international trade. And Mr. Suen was saying that the volume of e-commerce right now is $300 billion, and there is another center of such economic innovation growth in Asia. This is naturally Singapore, and I think that Singapore model, innovation model of innovation's uh, miracle looks a bit different. And for me personally, it was a symbiosis of unique business climate and the act, uh, active stimulation of the innovative process by the state. Mr. Francis Yeo, you are a professor of entrepreneurship mastery of the School of Information uh, Technology of Singapore. Uh, in, in your opinion, in your point of view, what social cultural peculiarities in Singapore allowed you to achieve this economic miracle? morning. Dobre. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, coming from a very tiny city state like Singapore, I think I'm humbled to be uh, discussing with the experts here from a much larger economies. Let me... Uh, oh, I cannot. Okay. Uh, let me share a little bit of what, uh, what Singapore does. Uh, I wouldn't so there to call it a model, but it is some lessons that we have learned. But before that, let me share a little bit about my uh, country, Singapore. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I have been involved in um, entrepreneurship and innovation for many years. Uh, I'm now a professor at the National University of Singapore, but uh, I was uh, previously handling uh, the uh, role of uh, uh, CEO of the National Research Foundation, which is a uh, office set up by the Singapore government to promote research, innovation, and enterprise. And a lot of the things that I would talk about would uh, draw from that experience. Now, uh, where is Singapore? Um, when you see Singapore on the world map, uh, you probably need a magnifying glass because uh, you, you, cannot, you cannot find it, right? So it's a, it's a tiny speck. If you compare it with... Uh, Russia, for instance, I think the comparisons are uh, really uh, way out. For example, Russia is uh, 24,000 times bigger, 24,000 times bigger in land area, and uh, 26,000 times in population. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the, the comparisons are really uh, uh, very different. But because we are a very small nation, and because we do not have natural resources of oil or gas or whatever, so Singapore has to work very hard. So this is an example of the Singapore's, uh, this is a chart of the Singapore's economic development over the years, over the last 50 years. Singapore gained independence in uh, uh, 1965. So the economic development has uh, been uh, uh, advancing well, uh, but uh, Singapore has con continually got to reinvent ourselves because as things change, you know, we have to adapt. So if you look at the chart, 
when Singapore started, it was a labor-intensive economy. There was high unemployment, uh, no jobs available. So the strategy was to get companies to come to Singapore, international, multinationals to come to Singapore to set up factories so that jobs can be created for the people. And as uh, the job situation uh, settles, uh, improves, then the emphasis was on capital investment, uh, skills, in in, uh, skills intensive and capital intensive, developing the skills of the people, uh, putting more capital investments. And then as we move along into the 90s, uh, it becomes more technology intensive and uh, knowledge intensive. So this is the situation that we are in. And of course, when uh, the, the country is uh, in the early stages of development, we do not talk about innovation, right? So innovation, R&D, comes in probably in the 90s. 90s, so the last 20, 25 years. Uh, I've been in the generation that you see the, the very dramatic growth of Singapore. So I've um, uh, seen the transformation of Singapore from uh, uh, sort of uh, this is Singapore River, you know, with a lot of small boats, small trading centre, to what it is today, right? The same place, uh, which is a very modern uh, metropolis. So, the, we, were, we were fortunate in that the different strategies seem to work for us. Uh, so now we are addressing the very important part of entering into innovation economy. Uh, so, the government worked very hard, and I think Singapore is known for quite a strong state intervention in the uh, affairs of, uh, of industry. Uh, so, because of the hard work and, and because of, uh, uh, we are fortunate, Singapore was able uh, to be linked quite well, uh, be ranked quite well in international rankings. For example, in the use of uh, IT, in e-government, and particularly the ease of doing business, uh, which is a uh, which is a very important part of a, for a small nation, but you want a lot of business to happen. Also, in terms of the number of internet firms uh, per one million population, you see that although Singapore has a very small population, but when you normalize the internet companies as a, a per a million, normalize it by the population, it's actually quite big. Uh, the, the circle that you see in Singapore is quite, quite a lot bigger, uh, only smaller than Israel. And uh, this was a recent uh, uh, study uh, that, that put Singapore as the number one most innovative, innovative city in the Asia Pacific. And then there are some more uh, reports in the media about Singapore's efforts. So let me talk a little bit about, uh, but the panel talks about social cultural factors affecting innovation. And I think people would think uh, of factors like this, right? A rich science and technology base, openness and diversity, tolerance of untidiness, willingness to take risks, acceptance of failure, perhaps even a celebration of failure as a learning experience. Uh, we don't have time to talk about too much, but to me, in my experience of uh, living and working in Singapore, I think the most uh, important factor that affects innovation, that is uh, social cultural, is really the openness and the diversity. So let me give you a few examples. Uh, Singapore is open to uh, and welcoming of business from all over the world. So it is a multinational business environment. We've got, uh, we've got big companies from the US, Europe, uh, in, the, in the early days, and uh, increasingly now more from uh, China, from India, also from the region. So it's a very open business environment, tens of thousands of uh, multinational companies. Uh, we, to support this sort of business environment, there's a lot of investments in infrastructure, the port, the airport, the highways, uh, and, and projects like uh, Marina Barrage, which is a, which is a, a, a reservoir, uh, which is right at the heart of the Singapore River. I'll give you an extra example. In my work uh, previously, even in research and uh, development, uh, Singapore adopted a very open uh, approach of cooperation. So this was a project, this was a major project to build a campus that would uh, undertake world-class uh, research. And, uh, you know, we invited some of the top uh, institutions in the world, which are known for their good science as well as their good innovation, to come to Singapore uh, to, to set up uh, research labs so that uh, we, we, you know, there's, there's, there's diversity and there's a lot of ideas in, uh, in R&D. Uh, similarly, we uh, were very open to talent from all over the world. So one of the programs was a, a research uh, a fellowship which is extended to young scientists from all over the world to come to Singapore 
and uh, if they are selected, they get five years grant, uh, quite a generous grant. They get a position as an assistant professor in the university. And so over the years, we have got, uh, as you can see on the chart, 65 fellows, uh, very bright young scientists under the age of 35 from all over the world that is carrying out the research in Singapore. And every year also, we organize the Young Scientists Summit where young scientists from all over the world are invited to, to be in Singapore and we gather more than 20 top scientists, Nobel laureates, uh, Turing uh, Awards winners, Millennium Prize winners, Fields medalists, at the very top of the, the, the science to come and uh, have dialogues with the scientists, not just from Singapore, but also from the rest of the world. Okay, uh, in the universities uh, where I come from, the NUS, uh, the, there's a very popular program for many years now that sends undergraduates, young uh, 20-something students all over the world to immerse themselves in the entrepreneur environment. Uh, it started off with Silicon Valley, but it has now grown to so many uh, locations, as you can see, in Beijing, in Shanghai, in, uh, in uh, Stockholm, in, uh, in Israel. So, so this be, these students would spend up to a year immersing in the entrepreneurial environment, perhaps acting as an intern to the startups. Okay. So, in, in my previous work at the National Research Foundation, we wanted to develop an R&D-based in innovation enterprise ecosystem that will look at how R&D can uh, move over from to innovation to, to commercialization and to have all the factors that would help, uh, for example, venture capital, universities, innovation, and so on, that, to, to make this a uh, vibrant ecosystem. So this is the ecosystem that uh, Singapore has now as a result of many, many initiatives. I, I, I do not have the time to mention all of them. So in terms of venture capitalists, in terms of uh, incubators, in terms of uh, government agencies that are promoting uh, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship in terms of also of events. Okay, so in conclusion, I think uh, uh, Harvard professor Josh Lerner wrote a, a book about uh, developing entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystems. And I, he, gave some, he gave a long list of guidelines, but I think some of the, the few that I picked up here are, are relevant. That is, uh, innovation has to be done and developed in total, in an ecosystem approach. Uh, there's a need to leverage the local academic and scientific base, uh, understand the importance of global connections, and also uh, allow for creativity and flexibility. So in conclusion, uh, Singapore as a small country operating in a highly competitive globalized world, uh, developing an innovation ecosystem requires great openness and diversity, right? among other things, but openness and diversity is important. The country must be open and relevant, nimble and flexible if it aspires to become a significant and value-adding node in the global innovation network. Thank you. Mr. Yeo, thank you very much for this great presentation. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact uh, that um, um, Mr. Yeo said we don't have oil and gas, that's why we have to work hard. Of course, it's different um, for Russia because Russia has great vast amount of natural resources. And a week ago, I participated in discussion where young Russian innovators uh, participated and they were discussing how their ideas could be implemented, how they could introduce innovations in Russia and their dream is to get uh, um, the, um, the contract for a large company. And it was like a, a almost a vo well half voluntary, half forced way of uh, introducing innovations. We are having Deputy Minister for Energy, Mr. Tesla, uh, and um, uh, Tesla. And I know that next year um, you're going to spend 170 billion rubles, um, which is about $6 billion uh, that is going to be invested um, for, um, um, for uh, investing innovation. So can you give us more details about uh, the innovative program of our large industrial companies is about 170 billion rubles. So what's behind this amount? 
So let me remind you of statistics. Russia every year um, is growing in terms of oil extraction. And um, so we're using um, mon uh, advanced, modern, uh, innovative technologies and uh, in oil industry. And we have different technologies, chemical, uh, um, uh, thermal um, impact. And uh, this amount of money is provided by research institutions, by research programs. Uh, related to the introduction of such technologies, so they could be used uh, uh, more effectively in order to expand the uh, oil extraction uh, um, um, volume and improve its economic indicators. So speaking about the role of the state, today our state program for energy efficiency and energy development, we have already m taken certain measures, uh, certain uh, steps to introduce innovations. As, as an example, I can uh, tell you that uh, um, some fuels are going to be uh, prohibited beginning with the next year, which is um, which has a grade lower than four. So they have to modernize their equipment to comply with this standard. As an incentive uh, uh, for economic development, I can uh, give you another example. We have uh, uh, actually implemented the taxation reform. And um, um, we speak about uh, different kinds of o um, types of oil extraction, which are difficult uh, um, to uh, extract. And uh, so its extraction is much more expensive than usual, just regular technology. So our taxation system did not fit um, uh, here because our taxation system did not allow extracting such oil resources effectively. So by introducing this taxation reform, we managed to improve this situation. We managed to extract oil volume by 20 billion. So it means that this will be much more effective. And we are not going to stop here. We are going to continue our taxation reform in order to stimulate oil extraction. So these are those measures that have been adopted today. And at the same time, we are developing strategic documents uh, for example, energy-related strategy, um, the forecast for technological development of uh, uh, energy and fuel uh, industry. So we have identified uh, a number of innovative areas for development that include both commercial and uh, fundamental research. I can uh, list you those areas. Uh, first of all, it's geological surveys. And we have actually just uh, um, discussed certain uh, methods that can be used, the network accumulators that are going to change the energy uh, uh, balance on the international scale. It will have us, uh, it will uh, help uh, decrease the dependency on carbon, uh, of, uh, on carbon. Uh, then we are going to use uh, um, uh, different sources uh, of energy that can uh, the resume, uh, resumable uh, energy sources. And um, we are moving in the same vein. Uh, and our state program has certain uh, um, um, has made uh, certain steps that help us uh, introduce uh, um, uh, this resumable uh, sources of energy, and we hope that it would uh, be tenfold bigger than today. Now speaking about intellectual networks and high temperature superconductivity, and this would help us reduce losses during power supply. And we are using new kinds of fuel 
uh, that again will uh, help us decrease the dependency on carbon. And also we are um, um, uh, implementing um, new transport technologies, gas, hybrid sources, and this uh, uh, has also been addressed, and this will help us again uh, change um, uh, the automobile industry and the energy balance overall. So what are we doing at the moment to make sure these innovative uh, technologies are used effectively? so that the private uh, business uh, could benefit from this as well as uh, research institutions. We have developed uh, and uh, um, approved the roadmap uh, plan of activities to introduce uh, um, modern technologies and materials which involves uh, a very wide um, uh, interaction between all the stakeholders to promote innovations. First of all, we speak about the fundamental science. Together with Russian Academy of Science and uh, sectoral um, um, institutions, we develop uh, uh, modern programs. So this will help uh, improve uh, um, our um, fundamental sciences. Our analysis will help achieve certain breakthroughs. Then together with educational institutions, together with the Ministry of Education, we're going to develop special standards so that our young students could study in line with um, advanced technologies and uh, advanced vision of development. So there we are going to interact with educational institutions in the, um, various um, ways. We are going to monitor innovative programs and analyze those programs, thus promote uh, innovative methods uh, of development, trying to find the most uh, effective ways to stimulate the economy. And uh, uh, the development of uh, small and medium business is also a priority for us because these are um, those entities that will help uh, commercialize uh, this innovative process. So we interact actively with the Skolkovo Foundation as well as other innovative institutions that help us uh, promote um, these programs. We have also some special national projects that are going to deliver special technologies that are commercially effective. And we are going to identify 20 such projects, at least as part of this roadmap. And the ministry will be a mentor helping to promote these innovative projects that will um, affect positively the development of innovations in this country. So these, this is briefly uh, the outline of our work. Thank you very much, Alexei. So we have considered three um, examples so far. Uh, we have uh, heard about the Chinese innovative system uh, and um, we understand that uh, uh, this internal uh, market uh, was instrumental and uh, um, this uh, very tranquil state of mind that the Chinese investors have is very special for uh, that country. Then speaking about Singapore, um, the uh, population was uh, uh, ready to take risks and uh, then the, pro the um, government plays a very important role in uh, attracting young and scientists and Mr. Texler um, uh, told us about the innovative projects in Russia. And now I would like to ask uh, um, uh, Mr. Frank Fu, who is the executive vice president for business development, Kingsoft Office Software. You know, when I was getting ready for this presentation, I um, uh, downloaded your application and I saw that you have it in different languages, Chinese, Italian, many other languages. And um, you were work globally. Your company works in China and in the U.S. So um, do you think um, um, 
Uh, the innovative uh, project depends on society uh, that um, sees these innovations uh, um, introduced, or maybe socio-cultural uh, um, differences no longer matter in today's world. I'm honored to be here, uh, and uh, good morning to everyone. You know, I, I, I was. Um, uh, I was born and raised in Shanghai, and my dad studied Russian. So I grew up grew up uh, watching Russian movie with my dad. This is a, a wonderful experience. It's really intriguing. A beautiful country, and I'm very excited. This is my first trip to Moscow, and I think I'll be uh, coming back again and again. Uh, again, thanks very much for this opportunity to um, uh, to participate. Uh, many of you already know that China is a vast economy, but uh, it is still, in fact, a emerging market. It's still a developing market. Therefore, the innovation is critical to its success and survival. Uh, I like to talk about innovation in terms of um, policy, regulation, technology and also human relationship. China comes from a very traditional world. Therefore, its economy, its infrastructure, government policies, and the technology weren't very efficient in the past, especially the human relationship was a big hurdle for technology companies and uh, government agencies to, um, to operate. A lot of things are based on a relationship, especially human relationship. Therefore, it made it uh, uh, almost impossible to, uh, to grow, to innovate, and uh, to succeed on the um, global basis. Therefore, I think the Chinese government actually did a good job opening up the market to foreign investments. Uh, as a matter of fact, we benefited from uh, investments from Japan, from the United States, from Singapore, of course, and from uh, even uh, Russia. One of our sister company is a cell phone manufacturer, a uh, smartphone manufacturer called uh, Xiaomi. Xiaomi was uh, invested by a uh, Russian venture capital company, and I think one of the partners is uh, a gentleman named uh, Yuri Milner. Xiaomi, since its uh, uh, establishment, has been only in business for less than three years, and it's already worth billions of dollars. Kingsoft, on the other hand, has been in business for 25 years. We started from a PC product competing with Microsoft on a Microsoft Office. And uh, so we were trading behind for many years until about three years ago. We noticed that the mobile market has grown very, very fast, and Microsoft was not paying any attention. So our strategy to, to that was that is to start a mobile office suite, fully compatible with Microsoft Office, and um, also fully comparable in terms of features and the functionality. Today, we have over 700 million subscribers worldwide, and we support 46 languages, including Russian. You can download for free from um, our website, wps.com, or you can download from a Google Play Store, Google App Store. Um, on the mobile side alone, we have 300 million subscribers worldwide. So innovation is a critical part of our success. We focused very, very initially on a global market. Therefore, supporting the um, languages worldwide, as well as um, uh, packing everything down into a small size of a 100 meg software, which is equivalent to a Microsoft one gig software, is an innovation. Uh, we also included the social elements inside of our software, allowing the uh, users 
to collaborate, to communicate, and to socialize with their peers, colleagues, and friends. We've made it very easy for people to use their mobile device to view, to edit, and share their documents when they are on the business trips or outside of office. So you no longer have to be bound by your desks and um, office environments. Um, and uh, so I'm going to stop here and allow Oksana to ask a few more questions. Uh, and also, I welcome any uh, discussions our honored guests may have. Uh, Thank you very much. Maybe now let's uh, keep the Q&A session for later. And I would like now to give the floor to Mr. Oren Akahavi. Oren, could you tell us, you are a partner of the company Terra Venture Partners and the leading venture partner uh, in Israel that invests in innovation technologies that influences many people, millions of people in the world, not only in Israel. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that your annual uh, your annual investment is about a million dollars into a new R&D companies. So in your opinion, how principal it is to have national peculiarities of innovations in any other country, in, in your country in particular? First of all, I would like to thank you, Oksana, for inviting me to speak in the panel, and I want, would like to thank all, uh, all the guests for speaking. It was a pleasure to hear you. And uh, Terra Venture Partners is not uh, the biggest and uh, neither the leading uh, VC uh, in Israel, but it is a very interesting venture capital, which I will elaborate later. But I think uh, what's most important about uh, the Israeli innovational ecosystem is, of course, the Israeli entrepreneur. And uh, I think the Israeli entrepreneur is uh, compiled out of five pillars, and I will uh, uh, elaborate. So the first, uh, the first one is uh, there is a, a saying in Hebrew which has "Kol Israel Achim," uh, and translation means that all the Israelis are brothers, which means we take care for each other, which means uh, when, we ha when we are somewhere, we are together. So all my friends are here with me today, so, uh, and uh, we, uh, we keep each other's back. So that's the first one. The second one, I think, is that we do. We don't talk. We're not a talker. We're not a talker country. Uh, when we have to do something, we just jump uh, to the deepest water we can and we do what we have to. I think this is, uh, also came from the place that Israel is, uh, 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 must innovate because uh, it's a necessity of life. Israel is a very small country, as exactly like my colleague from uh, Singapore mentioned about his country, but we're now about seven and a half million people. Not all of them are Jews, of course, and uh, Jews are trying to take care for each other. And I think the country is around 66 years of age. Uh, and we reached some really, really nice milestones. If you uh, look at it as an investment of, uh, uh, or as a startup, then it's definitely a startup nation. So there are a lot of numbers regarding Israel, and I guess uh, you must have heard a lot, of, a lot of them. For example, there is a number one rank in Nobel Prizes per capita. It's number one uh, ranked in uh, uh, in uh, VC investments per capita, it number one ranked in patents per capita. It's uh, ranked. Uh, it's called Silicon Valley number two. It's only third in the Nasdaq after U.S. and China. So, how can a, how can a country, a state with only seven million people? can be so successful. It's only because of the people. It's only because of the human capital, not because of venture capital. So that's what we hear. And as I said, the first one, we're all brothers. The second one, the, uh, we do stuff and we don't talk. Uh, the third one, it's a necessity of life, and because of the army as well. In the army, there are many units, many technological units, many things that we must do in order to survive. Okay, we have to develop new technologies, new weapons, new SIGINT uh, uh, capabilities, uh, and of course, uh, new ways to do what we do. Uh, but uh, we cannot elaborate about all the things what we do in the army, of course. So. 
Another thing that I think the four pillar of the Israeli entrepreneur and the ecosystem in general is fail is okay. You can fail, nothing will happen to you. I know there are many, many cultures that failure is not all right. If you, if you fail, then it's like a sign on your uh, forehead or something like that. In Israel, if you fail, then uh, your father comes to you and you tell you, okay, now do other stuff because uh, you learned your lesson so you can go on and do what you can do. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I wrote uh, things for myself, but I don't understand everything. So another thing is because maybe not just because of the army, but uh, because the failure is okay and everything. So people are becoming braver and braver. And they are trying to find really simple solutions to really hard 21st century problems. Because when we arrived, not, not myself, but uh, my ancestors, for example, they arrived in Israel 66 years ago. So they saw a country that was basically a desert, okay? There was nothing over there. And they had to bring water and food and technology and uh, to make uh, connections with the world that didn't want Israel to exist, most of the world. And uh, so we had to think out of the box. And that's what you do in Israel. You all the time have to think out of the box in order to make things happen. You can see that the global community now believes in Israel. There are more than 350 innovation centers in Israel. There are uh, uh, there is a great connection with all the countries. The first R&D Microsoft, uh, uh, the first Microsoft R&D center outside of Redmond, USA, was opened in Israel as well. So. That's why I think uh, is the uh, uniqueness of the uh, Israeli entrepreneur, which impacts, of course, the ecosystem as a whole. Thank you. Oren, thank you very much. You told us about Israeli uh, features of ecosystem in a very detail. I would like to give the floor to uh, Vasily Bilov. Uh, the senior vice uh, president of innovation, Skolkova Vasily, I would like you uh, that uh, you would talk a little bit uh, closer to the ending of our session because Skolkova Foundation takes a special place in the Russian innovation model, and I know that uh, during the period of establishment of Skolkova Foundation, you were studying international experience. Could you tell us what models and what what countries' experience uh, you? Uh, took for yourself and you used for yourself, it's, it's uh, too early to speak about the results yet, but did you manage to adapt some of the models in the Russian uh, circumstances? Oksana, thank you very much for the uh, question. And you know, I would say that in the world there are no two ecosystems, innovation ecosystems in the world that would completely match, like 70 or 70, 80 percent match. Uh, there, it's such, such a diversified area of uh, projects and activities. And I think that each country uses its uh, advantages and social cultural peculiarities. That's, and uh, this is today's topic of, of our discussion today. I will give you a couple of examples, or maybe let's talk about the types of uh, innovation ecosystems. What are their principal differences and around what they can be built? And the first and the main category that you can you can differentiate them. This is the uh, the content of ecosystems by elements. If we, uh, what we heard from the previous speakers, there are certain elements that are necessary in order to create innovations. And naturally, this is R and D foundation. So ecosystems should be built either to, uh, in connection to the R&D or near R&D or based on IRD or in partnership with the university or R&D center. So the uh, scientific component is very important and can be innovation ecosystem that is be can be based on the university's foundation that is, for example, happens in Massachusetts around Boston area and uh, in other places. And the second uh, area, so to speak, that you can diversify it when you're building the ecosystem, this is the industrial uh, belonging. This can be an ecosystem that is built in one particular industry 
or that works uh, with industries that converge. If we're talking about Skolkova project, that here we worked in five industries. This is energy, IT, uh, medicine, uh, uh, radio technologies, and, co and space. And uh, I think that the choice was made uh, by the uh, competitiveness of those areas. Uh, for example, in such areas as innovation technologies, uh, Russian companies are pretty uh, competitive in, in the global market. And we know such companies as Yandex and many others uh, that are well known in the West, in, in abroad. In the area of energy, this, is, this area is very urgent for Russia. Russia in global scale uh, is a big market and we have to work with it in space. We have a good history, uh, and so we can be also competitive uh, in this area, and so on. So a very important uh, element of any ecosystem, we spoke about science, we talk about industry, industries, and this also cooperation with different markets. And these are big companies or industry that supports the development of ecosystem, because innovations this is to implement R&D activities uh, into business. And the key here is the last part of the phrase uh, that in Russia the scientific uh, community oftentimes forgets, that innovation, this is not R&D only. This is implementation of R&D that brings to business. And this implementation happens together with our industry partners that in one way or another should be integrated in any innovation ecosystem. Sometimes, as for example in Israel, it's pretty aggressive in a good uh, sense, a business environment that is oriented uh, on its effectiveness, on consuming new innovations, uh, where competitiveness is very important uh, and it is a driver of development of big business in Russia. And we also pay a lot of attention to this. And I think that here we have a lot to learn in terms of uh, being aggressive and uh, in terms of building business. Uh, as a part of our project, we integrate with big companies by involving them in our ecosystem, uh, by uh, placing the R&D centers of those companies in Skolkovo territory. We have more than 40 companies that are our partners today. And some of them, they already placed their R&D centers in Skolkovo. Some of them are still building them. We're quite a young project. They're only four years old. But in a couple of years, we'll have about 5,000 people working at our territory uh, Those are from those R&D centers. Uh, venture community. This is also a very important part of ecosystem. It's clear that without money, without investment, you can't really build any business. And here it's important to talk about it. So this is what uh, differentiate uh, ecosystem from, from just a uh, venture business or a venture company. In ecosystem, money comes together with mentorship these are smart money, so to speak. This is the money that actively invested in the company and the investor participates in management of the startup. If at the late stage of the company we're talking about IPO, that's not applicable at all there. Mostly the passive institutional investors or non-institutional investors who do not participate in management of the company. But at the early stage, when the startup idea goes through that death valley, so to speak, and we are, uh, and the destiny of the company is being uh, on, uh, at stake, so that venture capital is very important. So there are different stages here, in our opinion, and it's very important, especially for Russia, where this industry is being developing and it's quite big in uh, uh, in the international scale and uh, we support startups and we involve smart money and investors in ecosystem. In our case, we realize it at the, having several initiatives. One of them is our venture community. This is our venture partners. There are more than 100 venture funds that according to our agreements with them, uh, with a soft commitment, they gave us $1 billion. 
this available money to in invest in uh, Skolkovo residents. The second initiative that we started realizing not so long ago, I think it's extremely important, especially for the Russian market, this uh, angel investment. Investors here are even more active uh, in, uh, in uh, managing startups, and I, in my opinion, uh, Russia has a great potential here. In Russia, there are many well-to-do people uh, who have enough funds to invest in startups in order to understand that in the West there is the, this widely spread uh, model when you have several investments they create a group and they have a so-called syndicated investment in this case uh, contribution of each of them can start from ten thousand dollars which is absolutely say so to speak accessible money uh, for for many people in our country but culture of investment into early startups and management managing those startups this culture is uh, very young in our country if we calculate the dollar millionaires in russia in russia we, we dollar millionaires they invest 20 times less in startups than anywhere in the world this, uh, usually they invest in uh, real real estate this is stock market or some of the traditional projects. We don't have this culture yet, but it's a big potential, and it allows to uh, attract not only new money, but also to share your professional experience. Because they're the people who are very successful in business. They have something to share with the beginners, with the beginning entrepreneurs. And our third initiative that is also extremely important, uh, this is mentorship support. And I think that this is that very link of each ecosystem that allows us to translate, to transmit the experience and skills from those who are successful to those who just begin their professional activities and who are, uh, who are taking risks. Наверное, это такой основной взгляд на элементы экосистемы. Буквально еще пару слов хотел бы добавить про социокультурные особенности. Здесь, наверное, важно, чтобы при развитии собственных предпринимательских инициатив действительно была культура. The investment culture, we have to be tolerant um, uh, in terms of mistakes. We have to be ambitious. We have to be willing to generate something, to create something. And it's really important for us. And something that Russia lacks is international scale. Today, high technological, technology intensive business cannot be local in their scale. Those markets that uh, create innovations, even though we have such a big market here in Russia, it's a very competitive on the international scale. So in order to keep your positions on internal market, you have to be competitive on the global scale. So this is the area that needs development. And so all our innovators should be aware of that and try to be as ambitious as possible. Thank you, Vasily, very much. And Oren, uh, you have something to add. You're welcome. Uh, I saw that uh, time is running up, so uh, I wanted to let the people know that uh, it's very appreciated that they sit here all the time. <laughs> it was uh, very interesting for me. And uh, of course, you can add me on Facebook and LinkedIn. I'm very active and I would like to connect with any of you and the panelists, of course. So you are welcome. Спасибо большое. Уважаемые коллеги, ну вот Оран абсолютно прав, что... That's true. Thank you, Oran, and thank you, dear colleagues. We are running uh, out of time, and maybe we have just touched upon certain issues uh, that we face today. And it's not only related to innovations, uh, creating innovations and innovative model. And... Um, I'm sure we'll have another chance to discuss this at different sections because our forum is about innovation. So thank you very much for taking part in this morning discussion and best of luck for your work. And dear colleagues, uh, I would like to invite you to go to plenary meeting hall.